Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, let's get started. So hi, my name is Andrew. I'm a tutor in the Department of Psychology. Um, so first of all, welcome everyone to Hong Kong U. Welcome to our information day. Hopefully you have a fun day and then learn more about what we do here and then also learn more about psychology. Uh, so starting us off strong, we've got our first speaker, Professor Benjamin Becker. So Professor Becker is an expert in how the brain works and how it's linked to our thinking and behavior. Uh, particularly with a focus on emotional and motivational processes. Um, so take it away, Professor. Okay, thanks very much. Can you understand me? Is the microphone working? Yes? Okay, great. So basically, thanks already for the introduction. I think when we have guests, and it's nice to see that we have so many guests, so many interested young students here for psychology, I would like to... It's a little bit higher. Oh, okay. I would like to introduce myself first. So my name is Ben Becker. I've been studying psychology in Germany, then went on to make my doctor, so my uh, Dr. Brer Nutt, so the PhD, went on as postdoc over in Germany and acquired additional knowledge in effective neuroscience, so how the brain processes emotions, then was leading a team in China that although try to find out how the brain processes emotions, how we can develop novel treatments. And finally, I'm now here at the HKU. It's very nice to see that so many of you are interested in neuroscience and other in psychology. So my research focuses on trying to understand how the brain processes emotions, how the brain processes motivation, and although with a strong clinical focus. So basically trying to find out how these processes go wrong in patients with mental disorders <clears throat> with a long-term aim to try to not just understand what goes wrong in mental disorders in brain processes, but also to modulate these processes to in the long run establish better treatments for disorders like anxiety and like depression. These are very common disorders, meanwhile, as I will also show you in the next slides. So it's quite a pressing issue to develop new and better treatments for these disorders. Um, we are doing this using novel technologies. So for instance, brain imaging technologies, as you see here, this is an MRI scanner, and we are using MRI or all the other technologies to basically image the brain. That is, we are trying to observe the working brain and to understand the brain processes here. This is not just, <clears throat> this is a relatively new technology, and we are not just using this to image the brains to, to observe the brain, but also to modulate the brain. So for instance, we and others have developed brain trainings that basically where the subject sees their own brain activity and can learn to control their brain activity. And this is very nice or it's very interesting, but it also has a good clinical application. If we can train someone to control their brain, we can maybe also improve people to teach them to regulate their emotions better. But enough about me. Let's come back to the major topic, and this is effective neuroscience. This means how can we understand how the brain processes emotions? The term effective neuroscience or the field was coined by Jak Pankzev around 30 years ago. There you see that compared to other parts of psychology, but also in general science or compared to medicine, it's a really relatively young field. 30 years, it's not very long. And it also brings together different disciplines. So it has a strong focus on psychology, on emotional psychology, but although we are including neuroscience, so although partly animal studies, but also biology and strongly technological progress. That is uh, progress in technology on the one hand side, like for instance, brain imaging technologies, but also on computational methods on the other hand side, like for instance, artificial intelligence. And this is the field that has been recently developed. And as I said, it's only relatively young. It's maybe 30 years. And the brain is, as you will heard, all of you is the most complex system in the universe. So it's very, a very big challenge to understand this. And in 30 years, so we are still relatively at the beginning. However, let's just project ourselves in the future. And let's assume we now perfectly now how the brain processes emotions. So how the brain generates emotional states like fear, like anxiety, and how the brain can regulate it. This could have pretty strong implications in all of our everyday lives. So let's consider what could we reach if we understand how the brain processes emotions. One thing, and I've already mentioned this, is 
we could apply this to mental disorders because mental disorders have become the leading cause of disabilities worldwide. So this means it's a huge health problem. So lots of people are suffering from mental disorders and we currently don't have good treatments. So the current numbers say that one in five people will suffer from a mental disorder once in their lives. And you can imagine here, we have five, six people sitting here in, the, in each row. So in each row, maybe one person will suffer from a mental disorder. So you see this number is huge. If we think about this number in Hong Kong, but also if we think about this number in China, in Asia, or also in Europe. So it's a huge number of people who are suffering once in their life from a mental disorder. We then, if we look into the numbers, we see that the most common disorders, so the most well often occurring disorders are anxiety, depression, and other addiction. And if we think about these disorders, these disorders are characterized by very strong negative emotions. So people with anxiety disorders have very strong fear. People with depression experience long and persistent sadness. So these are very strong emotional symptoms. If we now could somehow understand which brain processes are different in these patients, we can come up with new solutions to treat them. So probably if we can understand that which brain regions are specifically disrupted, dysfunctional in someone with a depression or in someone with anxiety, then we can try to use new technologies to normalize these brain regions. And for this end, we can, for instance, use TMS, which is a new technology that can, with uh, magnetic fields, can stimulate specific brain regions. And we can also use our brain training that we have developed. So this can help in the long run to make the brain normal again in these patients and hopefully help them to cure their disorder. Another important aspect is that we see emotions will impact lots of our daily life. And one thing that, that may happen or that although has a big um, impact is that we can read out emotions in everyday life if we have these new technologies. So for instance, we can not just use this currently an MRI to read out the brain emotions, but meanwhile, we see new technologies are used to also read out emotions or fatigue or fear or arousal in, well, everyday life situations. Like for instance, if we could understand how the brain processes stress, how the brain becomes tired, we can measure this online in, for instance, pilot to, um, to avoid accidents. Another part is where we currently see where this is becoming more and more important is that robots are developed, for instance, in care to take care about older people. And if we could train these robots to understand emotions, they can much better communicate with humans. So these are all applications in everyday life. However, understanding how the brain processes emotions also has, well, let's say societal impacts. So for instance, we see that lots of crime is not crime that is like you see in the TV, the big money heist where people try to try to steal money. Most of the crime is actually induced by strong emotions. So we see that lots of the violent crimes are actually hate crimes where people have very strong negative emotions against other people like anger and can't control their impulsivity. So lots of these crimes are actually are considered hate crimes. And if we look at numbers, for instance, from the USA, we see that it's a huge amount of crimes that happens because of these emotions. So it's in 2021, around 10,000 crimes uh, have been conducted as by a hate because other people have so strong emotions. And this is a huge number. And if we could understand now how we can better control these emotions, we can also reduce the number of crimes or we can also consider how has justice has to deal with this. Another important aspect is, and this controls our everyday life is we can try to understand how external environments influences our brain and our mental health. A current very important topic is for instance, to try to understand how social media use or how mobile phone use affects the brain and affects our emotions. And for this, we can use effective neuroscience to try to understand how, for instance, effective neuro uh, these mobile phone use or social media use affects our well-being and affects our brain. And to this end, we can also use novel imaging technologies and try to find out how does this impact on our brain 
And particularly all the, how does it impact on the brains of young children or of young people? You're all, the students are all pretty young. And the question is this constant mobile phone use or social media use, can it have negative impact? And we see initially, yes, it can have negative impact. So we see that this has been associated with lower mental health, with more anxiety, more depression, uh, eating disorders and lower self-esteem. The question is if we can understand which kind of brain mechanisms keep us online and keep us in this social media world, we can try to find, uh, we can try to get control back. So we can try to free us of this uh, constant social media use. These are all applications that we can use where we can use effective neuroscience. So you see that the implications, although we are still at the beginning, are relatively big. So we can try to approach mental disorders, we can answer questions about justice, and we can answer questions about how is, is the brain addicted, for instance, to social media. So the question is now, what are actually emotions? And let's start with a very general introduction or with a very general consideration. Emotions are, if we have a very careful definition, we can say emotions are complex, multidimensional processes in response to internal or external events. And this, from the general perspective, has an evolutionary advantage. So that can help us to avoid danger, for instance, like fear can help us to avoid danger, or although it can help us to identify opportunities when we see something very interesting or something that we, that we are striving, motivation is striving for this. So when we then talk in everyday life about emotion, when we talk, I'm, I'm afraid, when we say I'm very happy, we are mostly thinking about this subjective experience. So how you experience this subjective emotions. So for instance, you are telling, oh, I was very afraid in this situation. I was very nervous or on this occasion, I was very happy. However, from a scientific point of view, emotions are not just one dimensional, but we have several levels that are basically happening at the same time. So we see, in addition to this strong emotional subjective feeling, we see that we have physiological changes, like for instance, changes in the heartbeat or feeling like butterflies in your stomach, something like that. So we have these very strong physiological changes. We then, in addition, have neural changes. That is changes on the level of the brain that probably underlie the subjective experience. This is where we are often, as neuroscientists, having a specific uh, focus on. At the same time, we are also seeing, and this is, you will know this from everyday life, we see relatively specific changes in our posture, but also very strongly in our face. This allows us to also read emotions in other people. So if you see, for instance, someone who is really afraid or someone who is really happy, it will be relatively easy for you to identify this is based on the, on the emotional expression in the face. So sounds very... <clears throat> complex, very complicated, very technically now. So let's just look at an example. So imagine you are you are going to hike here in Hong Kong. What can happen is, well, maybe you encounter a snake. What happens then? Well, on the subjective experience level, probably most of us will be very afraid and will have this strong negative emotion of fear and want to run away. So it has a strong emotional component, but all the strong motivation to basically to, to run away very likely. In addition, we will have all the specific changes on the body. So think about you encounter a snake in a forest. So you're hiking, there's a big snake. What will you feel like? You will probably feel this fear, but at the same time in your body, your heart start pounding and you maybe start all those sweating. So you have an increased heart rate and increased muscle tension. This is basically the bodily preparation tool for two options that you have. That is running away, which is probably the best option for a snake, or you can fight the snake. So you see, you feel this feeling, but at the same time, your body gets prepared to react to this. And this is evolutionary, very important to keep you alive. The other thing that you will also know that you will feel very likely is you have a very clear facial and bodily expression. So think about which kind of face expression would you make when you encounter a snake at night in the forest. Or think about which face expression your friends will make. It's very clear. You show a very fearful face, probably. The body position will also change. So either maybe you will already run away, so you will startle away, or you will run towards the snake. 
probably you will run away. I would, I at least will run away very likely. What we also have in addition, and this is where we mostly are interested in as scientists or, or my research is also interested in is the specific brain changes that happen. So at the same time, when we, when this all happens together, when our body changes, when we feel a change in the emotion, and when we have this probably very specific face expression, we see that there are very specific changes in the brain. What we see, for instance, for fear is that one brain region, it's called the amygdala, which is <coughs> Greece for element, that this small brain region in the very uh, deep part of the brain, uh, that this region becomes very active. This is often considered as fear center of the brain. So this region maybe informs other brain regions that they're like the prefrontal cortex, that this could be something very dangerous, so better run away. And at the same time, this region also regulates some bodily expressions. So we see that the brain is very important in regulating our feelings, but also in regulating the bodily response or regulating the facial expression response in this moment. So now let's try to find out how can we how can we measure these brain changes? Well, we were very long, very restricted. So obviously we can't look in your head right now, not. So we can't look in the in the brains of humans. So what one could do is animal experiments. So for instance, um, damage a part of the brain in the animal and then see how it behaves later. However, we are mostly interested in human emotional experience and still we don't know is does a mouse, for instance, really feel fear like we feel the way of fear? So it's very important to also look at humans in this research field. Very long we were restricted and we could just basically examine patients who had a very specific brain lesion. For instance, this one is a very famous patient in the literature. He's called Phineas Gake. He, he was a railroad worker and he had an accident. What happened is a metal rod, so this metal, went through his mouth and through his forebrain. Luckily, he survived. So everyone was really surprised that he survived. He just lost one eye, but still he survived. However, afterwards, the friends and all of the medical doctors observed that there were changes in his personality. So he was very impulsive and he made lots of bad decisions. So based on this initial evidence, we basically could conclude that okay, this region of the brain, the prefrontal cortex is involved in decision-making and in regulating their emotions. We also have like a handful of other patients, for instance, these patients that I've been working with in Germany, they have a genetic disorder and they lack the amygdala. So the brain region we were just talking about, you see here in green or in blue, they lack the amygdala because of a genetic disorder. And these patients didn't experience fear or didn't recognize fear in other people's faces. So with these kind of studies, we can then say, okay, these patients do not have a functioning amygdala. They have a very specific deficit. So we can conclude this brain region is involved in fear, for instance. However, this is very restricted. So we have to find patients with these kind of disorders, and then we have to measure them. So we are very, very restricted in terms of research. Luckily, over the last 20, 30 years, we have seen an enormous progress in brain imaging technologies. These are technologies that allow us to basically to image the brain while it is working without, well, without opening the skull or without having to, to implement something negative for the subject. We have different kind of technologies. My research field is probably fMRI. Yeah. And let's just show how a typical oh. fMRI experiment well. looks. This uh, oh, fMRI experiment, we basically put subject in the fMRI scanner and at the same time have uh, could show pictures to the subject. So it's basically a bit like you have an Xbox. So the subject sees something, can respond, and um, we can communicate with the subject. In a typical experiment, we, for instance, show, uh, show emotional pictures, like disgusting pictures to the subject, and ask them, how disgusting do you think this is? Then we can compare the brain activity during processing something disgusting as compared to processing something neutral. What we then see is we see that specific brain regions become more active, like for instance, again, the amygdala or all the other brain regions that are involved in the emotional processes underlying disgust. All right, so I think, I hope I have provided you with a general overview of what we are doing. So we are trying to find out 
which brain regions are involved in emotional processes, how does the brain process this, and how can we use technology to basically to make this visible. Thanks very much for your attention, and I'm all open for questions. Right, so thank you so much, um, Professor Becker, for your talk. So we maybe have time to take one or two questions. Does anyone have any questions for Professor Becker right at the moment? Maybe I've got one. Okay. Okay, so um, you've obviously been doing this research a long time. So what would you say is maybe like some of the trends that you may have noticed in recent years? Because you know, things like social media have been exploding. Oh, yes. So, so what I've seen, are, or my my impression is, at least that we see different kind of trends. So one trend is it's becoming more and more technical. So the field tries to include not just or tries to bring together psychology with recent developments, not just in technology, but also in artificial intelligence and in brain computer interfaces. You may, for instance, all know Neuralink right now from Elon Musk, which is trying to break a brain computer interface and which is quite exciting, but on the other hand, researchers in my field are doing this like 10 years already. So it's uh, it's getting more and more technical. This is one part. The other part is uh, we are trying to bring this more and more into the clinic to although not just to observe in patients what is different, but also to try to, to really help them to normalize their brain based on neuromodulation techniques. So techniques that directly can change the brain. All right, we have a question there. Uh, may I ask in general, what is the lifestyle of such of like a psychology student, like in general? Like what, like what studies they do or like the, like basically the life of the student? I think you can question. probably answer this better. Huh? <laughs> I'm too old, sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah, so this is maybe a, a general question that I'm sure you guys are all interested in. Um, but maybe a bit too general for this topic. So we do have some consultation rooms on the sixth floor. So if you want to go and ask about that later on, then please go and do that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, so I guess we'll keep going. So thank you for your question. And also thank you, Professor Becker. Um, so uh, let's bring up our next speaker. Oh, okay. So yeah, our next speaker is Dr. Terry Wong. I'm very happy to invite you to talk. Um, so Dr. Terry Wong is an expert in how we process numbers and also how we solve mathematical problems. Um, which is relevant to all of us here, and also very relevant to the educational side of psychology, which I'm sure a lot of you are interested in also. Um, so today, Dr. Terry Wong will be talking about how we understand numbers a little bit. So good morning. Testing, testing. Okay, so good morning. So welcome to Hong Kong U. So I'm Dr. Terry Wong and I'm an assistant professor here. So I'm also an educational psychologist. So today I'm going to share with you on this topic, the origin of our math skills. So you're in the right room, is a psychology lecture, but we also study math because psychology is basically about everything related to human being, including our math skills. So before I start my talk, I would like to do a quick survey. How many of you actually like math? A few hands on me. Okay, how many of you hate math? Seems to be more hands. Okay, so this is what we observe we actually see that some individuals, they are very good at math and they like math very much, but some of them hate math a lot. So here you can, let me see if I can play it. 
You can try it yourself as well. Plus the number of seven plus twenty four plus fifty four plus eighteen equals. Okay, so you see that this kid is really good at math because he can do so complicated mental calculation in his brain. Well, at the same time, Well, at the same time, you see some individual who really struggle in math. This is one of the examples. So I think it's a second grader. This is how he or she counted 10, 20, 30, 40, 51, 52. So you can imagine if these kids are in the same classroom, so there will be huge difficulties for these students to really enjoy math, right? Because he basically fell in the most simple math problem. Okay, so this is the individual difference that we observe in math skills. Then this leads us to the question of why is there such a great individual difference in our math skills? So this leads us to a very long held debate concerning nature versus nurture. So um, psychologists hold different views about human um, quality, human traits. So some believe that our, hum our qualities, our capacities, are all determined by nature, which means that if you are good at math, it means that you have good math genes. It's equipped in your genes, regardless of whether you attend a good school, uh, you have good um, parents who nurture you well, it doesn't matter. If you have good genes, then you will be good at something. Well, the nurture view actually holds that um, we are born with a blank state, like a blank piece of paper. So whether you are good at something, whether you like something, it mainly depends on whether you have a good environment, whether you attend good schools, where, whether you go to tutorial centers, etc. So this is a long held debate. So how do we actually address these questions? How do we know whether it's the nature that determines our ability or is the nurture? So in psychology, we have two major ways to answer this question. So the first way is we study animals. So we observe whether human abilities can be observed in animals as well. The second way is we study human infants. So because when you are born for like six months, probably you don't have much chance to learn from the world. So we can actually test them and see whether we can observe some abilities in infants. So let's show a video about animals first. Do you uh, know courses to do math? Because there was this whole course in Clever Homes who supposedly could solve problems like two fifths plus one half. I don't know how, 
But if you use the correct answer nine times, right now, you can still do nine times and then ten times. And if you can answer questions posed by random audience members, not just his master, he was a bit more shy around strangers, but he was understandable because, quote, of affection on the part of Hans, who for the last four years had had three course only in his master. <laughs> I'm so unsure. Anyway, this verse is quite a sensation. He was featured in the New York Times in 1904, and then a commission was formed to see if Hans really could do that. And as the New York Times published later in 1904, the expert commission decided that the horse actually reasoned. Okay, I'll stop here. So how many of you believe that Clever Hans actually solved math problems? Like three times four. Who thinks that Clever Hans can do it? Hands up. Who thinks that Clever Hans can't actually do it? More hands. So I'll pick one. Why do you think horse can't do math? The boy at the back. Is what? Impossible. Why is it impossible? They do not have the same intelligence as us. Uh, they do not have the same intelligence as us. They do not have the same intelligence as us. What if they actually have the intelligence, but we don't have the ability to identify? Mm, I just, I still don't think that they have the ability to like, um, so solve the problems and let us know the answer of it. Okay. But what we actually observe is that the, the horse actually taped, for example, 12 times when it was asked three times four. So how do we explain this? Mm, maybe it's, it is just pure luck or something. What? It was pure luck. Okay, pure luck. So let's check out the results. We have to do that article. I can't believe that 13 Okay, so now you see the tricks here. So what did we learn about these studies? So do animals have the ability to solve math problems? Yes or no? Seems not, so I will tell you otherwise later on. Okay, the second thing is that in these kind of experiments, we tend to jump to the conclusion that, okay, we see the whole solving math problem. Then we conclude that they have the ability but we have to care, be careful about the alternative explanations. So I said that there are two ways in which we test the nature and nurture question. What's the other way that we can test it? Who do we test? Children or more precisely infants. Okay. So then the question is how do we study infants? They don't speak to us, right? Imagine if you are only six months old, you don't know how to speak. How do we test them? Okay, so this is a very famous paradigm in infant studies. So we observe their behaviors indirectly. So how do we do this? I will show you pictures. You just look at those pictures. Okay, I have two questions for you. The first one is, what do you see? Heads. And 
lions. Good. The second thing is, which picture actually capture your attention the most? Cats, lions, many hands for lions. Okay, why is it the case? The logic is very simple. When you first see the cat picture, you were probably very interested in it because it's very cute. And then you see the second one, you still feel that is cute, so you pay attention to it. The third one, well, still cute. The fourth one, you'll probably get a little bit bored, so your attention goes away. Until when? Until you see the lions, right? When you see something new, it captures your attention again so that you look longer at that particular new picture. So this is the habituation paradigm. When you see something repeatedly, you get habituated, you get bored, so your attention goes away. When you suddenly see something new, then it captures your attention again. So this is called dishabituation. So if you show a dishabituation, that means that you notice something new here. This is the paradigm which we use to study infants. So basically, infants are studied in a similar setting where infants sit here, usually on the lap of the parents, and then the stimuli is shown here. So this is the logic of habituation. When you first see something, you look very long at it, and then your attention drops with time. Until you see something new, then it captures your attention. There's a rebound in looking time. So like 30 years ago, these researchers tried to use this paradigm on seven-month-old infants. It's not, they not even turned one yet. They showed them either two objects or three objects. These are random objects that you see in a household. So after like showing either an array of two objects or an array of three objects. So then they show either two or three objects displayed to them and see whether their looking time rebounds. Okay? So the logic is that suppose if you are an infant, you can tell the difference between two and three when you repeatedly see two objects you get bored by two, suddenly you see three, what would you behave? How would you behave? It captures your attention and you look longer, right? So if when the infant is habituated with two and then you see three, the attention will rebound and you see a rebound in looking time. But if you can't tell the difference between two and three, Probably after repeatedly seeing two and then you see three, you think it's still the same. So there's no rebounds in looking time. So this is what the results tell us. When infants are habituated with two objects, and then you see either two objects or three objects, you can see that the looking time for three objects is actually longer than that of two objects. So that means infants can tell the difference between two and three. The same applies when the infant is habituated with three objects. So the looking time for two objects is greater than that for three objects. Okay? So from here, you can see that infants are able to differentiate between two and three. So later, 10 years later, another group of researchers using the same paradigm to look at whether infants can differentiate between eight versus 16 dogs. So the logic is the same, I'll skip it, but the conclusion we have that is six month old infants seems to be able to differentiate between eight and 16 because the locking time for the new number is actually longer than that for the old number. But when we change the numbers from eight to 16 to eight versus 12, there's no difference in looking time. So what does it mean? Eight 
and 12 looks the same to the infants. Okay? So these are the conclusions that we draw from these experiments. Infants are able to tell the difference between two and three, eight versus 16, but not eight versus 12. So apparently, even infants seems to have a basic sense of numbers, although it's not very precise because they can't tell the difference between eight versus 12. Of course, when we grow up, our number sense actually improves. For typical adults, you can actually differentiate between nine versus 10, okay? So in fact, this ability is not only found in human infants, it's also found in many animals. Because there was this one person, Clever Hans. Yeah. Oh, and here's another one of my favorite studies. They compared guppies to college students and found that the students and guppies showed almost identical performance patterns. Okay, maybe not identical. The student had been involved in swimming. It was actually very similar to the test I took at PanMax.com where you have to choose the larger of two sets of dots. The fish, on the other hand, are placed in a tank like this and tend to swim to the group with more fish. Both students and fish can distinguish numbers up to four, and beyond that, we both align the ratio between the groups. So, for example, distinguishing six from 24 is easier than six from eight. And with training, some animals can do way, way more than that. Like I knew the chimpanzee, and even Alex, the African gray parrot. Listen. Four is right. The system, the guts of the number, is something that's evolutionarily very old. I mean, rats have it, pigeons have it. Ants have it, bees have it, fish have it, and lions, birds, monkeys, apes, dogs, cats, goblins, bears, raccoons, elephants, and sea lions have it. Salamanders try to use the video to earn more flies. They can chicks choose a larger group of balls. Horses can that fraction, but they can't tell the difference between two and three. And they can't tell penguins and giraffes and velociraptors and all other animals have it too. It's not just us. Okay. Okay, so what conclusions can we draw from all these studies? So humans, like other animals, we are equipped with a basic sense of numbers. Why do we need this basic sense of numbers? How does it help us? Imagine you are born like 3,000 years ago. You don't have cell phones. You don't have Wi-Fi. How do we survive? We need to get the food by ourselves, right? So suppose you have two apple trees. One with 10 apples and one with 20 apples. Which tree will you climb up? Probably the tree with 20 apples. So this basic sense of number allowed you to survive better because it helps you with, for example, getting more food, etc. cetera. So um, time is short and I don't have time to cover the whole picture with you. What I haven't addressed here is whether this basic sense of number is actually related to your math skills. Is it true that for infants who are born with better number sense would actually get an A in topic exam in math? This is a question remains to be answered. If you're interested, come and study psychology and you know the answer. Okay, so that's all for my talk. Okay, so thank you so much, Dr. Terry Wong, for your talk. Um, does anyone have any questions for Dr. Wong? If not, then maybe in the interest of time, then we'll keep moving on. And then if you guys have questions after, you can approach him after the session. So thank you again. Okay, so our next speaker, last but not least, um, is Professor Zhang Chen. Um, so he's an expert in social psychology, which um, of course is uh, very interesting to all of us. Uh, so social psychology is all about how our behavior and how our thinking 
is influenced by our social connections and also how we interact with other people. So that affects all of us. Um, and Dr. Chen's area is about social exclusion and things such as objectification of others and stuff like that. Yep. So whenever you're ready. Uh, welcome to Hong Kong U. I uh, hope you are having fun. Uh, so uh, I'm a, my name is Zhang Cheng. So thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm a social psychologist. Um, so often, you know, students ask me, you know, what is psychology is about? What is social psychology? Um, so uh, the questions, answer to these questions can be very simple, but also can be very sophisticated. Um, so I think, you know, psychology, as uh, both the speak speakers mentioned, anything about human beings can be the subject of psychology. Um, you know, we study how people feel, how people think, and how they behave. Uh, and how, you know, this could be on yourself, how you think about yourself, but also how you relate to other people, right? So if you just look at the lecture hall, look at the people next to you, on your left, on your right, you know, so so you see a difference, you know, in, in, in everyday life, we observe all kinds of individuals, how we interact with them, with them how these interactions shape who we are. You know, these all, all can be subjects of psychology. But I think psychology is quite unique in the sense that uh, uh, it uh, quite focuses on causal explanations. Uh, so if you uh, have been to uh, have heard, learned about some other disciplines, uh, for example, like political science, sociology, social work, maybe public health, they also study human behaviors or human thoughts, um, you know, could be subject to well-being. Um, so there's this, sometimes these questions that are shared among disciplines, but I think the difference lies in the methodology. Psychology is quite interested in the causal explanations. For example, I study social exclusion, so a lot of my research questions focus on why social exclusion leads to certain outcomes. For example, when we feel excluded by others, we may, might become quite aggressive, right? So, um, so um, if you're a sociology, probably you just uh, go to do interviews, to do surveys, trying to see whether social exclusion actually correlates or predicts aggression. But a psychology or social psychology, um, usually we're not satisfied with this kind of data. Uh, we usually ask, you know, do you have evidence to causal explanation to say you can pinpoint it's because of social exclusion leads to aggression. Uh, you know, there could be a lot of other things, right? Could be uh, maybe um, certain past experience make you have certain personalities in social settings. You became quite, you know, hostile. Then you get excluded. Then you also become very aggressive, right? So they both are not, uh, they are not, you know, although they are highly intertwined, but they are not one causing another. It's both caused by some other experiences. So, so psychology in general is very interesting to figure out what's going on between those two variables. Are we able to pinpoint the causal explanation from one to another? Right. So, so that's a fairly general question, just to, uh, I think, you know, some of you might be interested in. Um, so let me just keep something fairly quick. Um, so what I'm going to present are, okay, let me see. Uh, can I still share this? I want to play a video, you know, to... All right, so, um, you know, let's say if you're working on the street, there's a guy 
you know, trying to get a hug, would you hug him or her? Could it, could it be a lady? Who would give this guy a hug? Nobody? Only a few? Okay. Uh, so who said who would stay away trying to avoid this guy? <laughs> why is that? Can you tell me why you decided not to decide to stay away? Okay. All right. Um, so that's fine. Um, so we could have all kinds of responses, right? You could feel like, you know, this is maybe, could be unsafe, could be inappropriate, especially in East Asian cultures. We feel like we need to have a certain personal space. Uh, we are not trying to stay away from strangers, not to get too close. Um, that's possible. Um, but usually, you know, when you see a situation like this on the street, especially, you know, this is a guy who have been posted all kinds of videos. He go around the world at different places just to put on his mask and trying to get free hugs. Uh, he has been doing this for quite a while. And, uh, you know, from a lot of his videos, actually, he got a cut, you know, a lot of people get quite excited and they decide to give him a hug. Um, if you, you know, watch this for, for the longer, there's all kinds of scenarios. Uh, but, uh, but but I think is a um, I think this is um, um, I think this is just a, dem a demonstration that who how we behave how we think there's a lot of things coming to play you know we grew up in different environment uh, could it be you know Asia could it be U S uh, people you know we are shaped or socialized in very different ways and also our past experience you know how we are grew up by you know who our friends are who our parents are. Uh, what kind of beliefs we have, you know, all this feed in to influence how we think and behave. So, um, so it's not. Let's see. Uh, okay. All right. So, um, but uh, in general, even with all these differences, I think in general we tend to like to be liked, right? So nobody felt. So who feel like they do not want to be liked by others? They want to be hated. That's rare. A lot of cases, we still feel like we want to make friends, right? Especially when we are young, you know, you know, could it be high school, could it be in college? These are times we have very, we are very strongly motivated to explore, to understand the people around us, trying to, you know, get to know them, to get bonded. Um, so all these kind of, very, these are needs, they kind of like these motives are very strong. And uh, we tend to get harmed, you know, if we feel like we're being left out which can happen quite often, a lot more often than we would like. Um, you know, but they do happen. You know, we do get excluded at a different scenarios. Could it be at work? Could it be at a school? Um, you know, sometimes they are very subtle. You know, we feel like people are not talking to us. That we are being excluded. Sometimes it can be very extreme. Could it be bully, right? There could it be very explicit bully against, um, and anyone can be, you know, can be excluded, can suffer from bully. Um, so, so all these point to the things I, that I mentioned, you know, when you're trying to understand individuals as a social psychologist, we're trying to offer explanation. Why do people think this way? Why do people behave in this way? Why do we, you know, have this kind of feelings towards ourselves? Um, so all these can, um, you know, they can relate to a lot of um, concepts, you know, contracts we already know, like self-esteem, self-concept, self-regulation, uh, but certainly they can go a lot more than those, but those are some of the manifestations how, you know, like affect what we are talking about. Um, but uh, it turned out human beings are very complicated, so it's not as straight as we otherwise would think. Let's have a brief demonstration, okay? So um, just uh, a give a response from one to five, okay? The... One, two, three, four, four, okay, five. Yeah, lots of four and five, okay. Basically, we strongly agree, right? Basically, you know, we agree or strongly agree. Second question. Let me start from one, two, three, four, five. Again, it's a similar, fairly similar pattern. We think, you know, these are something that's quite serious, right? 
So, and also um, this is about uh, our perception about our government, what our government should be doing. Should, do you think a government should do more to our citizens? Um, five, four, three, two, one. All right, this one, the response is much more diverse. Um, all right, so next question. So this, yes or no, yes. Okay, good, no. All right, next one. Have you done any volunteering work? Yes, yeah. No, have not. All right. Have you expressed your feelings? You know, conveyed your opinions to the government? Yes. No. All right. I, I think that's you know that's um that's fairly. I think this is this kind of responses. Um, I think they are fairly normal. So usually we do see all kinds of um, variety of responses on questions like this. Um, so the I think this uh, tap into um, one key element. You know that's how we think and how we behave. Uh, sometimes they're not entirely consistent. So. Um, you know, although we feel like we are this kind of person, we tend to feel like we are consistent in our attitudes uh, and our behaviors. Um, I want to just mention one class classical study. So this is a time, remember, you know, when you, for social psychology, the social context is very important. You know, where the study was done, uh, when was it done, for example, if some study is done in Hong Kong versus in US, you know, you might observe different outcomes, right? If a study was done 100 years ago versus now, you know, people are quite different. We have changed over the years. So how we respond can also be quite different. Now, if you look at this study that was done almost a hundred years ago. Uh, so back then, um, the study was done in the United States. Um, back then, there was a strong prejudice towards the Chinese. So Chinese was back then, um, because, you know, it's a time with a lot of prejudice and hatred. The United States was not what it's like today. So back then, there was strong, you know, uh, stereotype prejudice against, against the Chinese. So this is Professor Lapierre. So he decided to uh, bring a Chinese couple who were graduate stu students back then to bring them to just walk around the campus to drive around um, to see how they are treated by restaurants. So, um, so basically, they went through they spent two summers um, to basically go through the nation to visit a lot of places together. They want to see, you know, his professor was quite interested in how the Chinese would be treated. So um, it turned out um, during these two summers, uh, these Chinese couples actually they were served by all the restaurants except one. And also it seems like the waiters, the waitress seems okay in serving them. You know, there's not much of, you know, angry face or being, you know, pushing them away. Um, uh, so, so he got quite, you know, intrigued, you know, he's like, what's going on? So afterwards, he sent them, he basically wrote to them, sent them a survey, ask them, uh, it's very simple, ask them, would you serve Chinese, Chinese in your restaurants? And uh, a lot of those places responded, and uh, in the response he got, a lot of people said, no, they won't. So basically, they said, they will not serve Chinese. Um, but that's not what the, you know, the professor experienced. So the experience was quite different from what people say. Um, so, so I think this is a very a classical study, uh, you know, intrigued, got a lot of interest. People get very intrigued trying to figure out what's going on. Um, so I just want to see the crowd. Do you guys have any thoughts what's going on? Why there's a huge difference in how the restaurants say they would not, you know, they basically they said they won't, most of them said they won't serve Chinese. But in fact, when the Chinese couples um, visited the restaurants, they most of them, almost all of the time, they got served, right? So, any explanations? Yes. Like maybe uh, my mom want me to study, and I think study have good result on my BSc, but I don't like to study. So I maybe my I don't have self control on my behavior. Although I have a attitude towards 
that thing, but I still don't do it in behavior. So I think what you are trying to say is um, somehow you cover your real intention. So even you don't like the Chinese couples, when they are here, you feel like you still have to serve them. So you basically save them. Okay, that's a good explanation. Any other explanations? Yes? Ah, yeah, yeah, I hear you. So you're basically saying it's um, hard. It can be challenging to reject someone when they are here already, when they're facing you, uh, versus just, you know, intentionally you don't, you can reject it. You want to reject them basically, but when they are right in front of you, it became challenging to reject them. True, so that's another possible reason. Any other possible explanations? Yes? Maybe the Chinese couple dress very nicely and uh, they spend a lot at the restaurant, so the way to decide to uh, serve them as any other. Okay, uh, so sure, uh, so that's certainly another possible reason. So maybe they have certain stereotypes about what the Chinese look like. Maybe they think about uh, immigrant workers, uh, illegal workers. Now there's a couple who appeared, they are graduate students, young couple, look very nice. So that's how they behave differently. Okay, any other possible explanations? Uh, how about, you know, is it possible that uh, maybe people still have very, you know, maybe different from the people who serve the Chinese couple? There might be a difference in, you know, who we're serving versus who will answer your question. But also, I think another very, you know, reasonable possible explanation is um, when people say they do not want to serve a Chinese couple, right? So that's kind of the opinion. They still have a very strong prejudice against the Chinese. Um, but uh, maybe in their actual interactions, so it's hard to know um, because we now, in, through psychology research, we know people function in very different systems. Uh, so basically one of the major lessons we learned from social psychology over the years, or psychology in general, is people function in a dual process. We are not, you know, a lot of times we think we know who we are. We know how we think, how we behave. Why do we behave in this way? But a lot of times, you know, that's something we can articulate. But also there's a, you know, a second process which often drives our behavior or action, which we do not know very well. So, so it's possible, you know, when you are interacting, there could be a lot of subtle cues, subtle ways People, uh, we turn, you know, the Chinese couple actually were prejudiced, but they didn't realize. So, for example, uh, in a very recent study, they, you know, just look at um, one group of people, you know, how they work around another group of people. Just when, let's say, when they meet on the, just we can meet anyway, just in the hallway. So, if there's someone I do not like, I have hold a very strong stereotype, I might just work, you know, around him or her instead of just uh, normally passing by this person. So the prejudice, this kind of behavior, this kind of um, action can be very subtle. They do not have to be on the very serving someone. They could be, you know, when you serve someone deep down, you have you hold, you are holding very strong uh, prejudice um, such that you are serving in a different way compared with other customers. Um, so, so, you know, I think all this speaks about the complexity of human thoughts and human behaviors. So these are very challenging. So basically these are the challenging, you know, uh, I think, you know, for psychology or social psychology is to find a ways to assess or capture those behaviors, those thoughts, those feelings. How can we marry them? And also, can we offer a reasonable explanation, you know, to figure out what's going on? Um, so for example, like my, just in this couple, you know, why do these um, strong prejudice Clearly, there's a strong stereotype of prejudice against Chinese, but why do their behavior doesn't match? So then you have to come up with, you know, a study design, trying to come up with a theory and trying to come up with design to test your theory. So basically that's kind of the gist of the field. All right, so it has been evolved for 
you know, it's not as entirely new as effective neuroscience, but still it's a new discipline. It's, uh, you know, has a history of um, less than 100 years. Uh, you start with the Second World War because the government needed to recruit soldiers to train them, to make them loyal. So that's how social psychologists became a discipline, trying to have the propaganda to make people become loyal to their own country or government to follow orders. Um, so basically they focus on people's behaviors and thoughts and the feelings, uh, how we capture them and how we uh, you know, understand what's going on among these different components. All right. Uh, any questions? Uh, let's... All right, so thank you, Professor Chen for the talk. Um, so in the interest of time, and I think you guys also maybe have places to go, then maybe we'll stop here. If you guys still have questions, of course, you can hang around and then approach our speakers for a few more minutes. Um, if you want to learn more about psychology, we have consultation rooms on the fourth floor and sixth floor. You can ask questions about university life and all that there. So thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs>